Mayin and Fernando Grostein Andrade, and narrated today the English version uh, by Oscar winning actor Morgan Freeman. As is widely known, as everyone knows here, both legal and illegal drugs can cause enormous damage to individuals and society when they are abused. These costs cannot be measured solely in terms of um, dollars and cents, but have to be understood in terms of human lives altered, families destroyed, and communities upended. In 2007, the cost of illicit drug use was estimated by one research institute to be more than $193 billion. That's not just the cost of drugs themselves, but includes direct and indirect costs, such as those related to crime, health care, and lost productivity. Lost productivity uh, accounts for an estimated $120 billion a year at that time, including costs due to declining labor, uh, costs for specialty treatment, hospitalization, incarceration, and premature mortality costs. The, the costs of drugs and drug abuse is enormous. And there are many ways to figure it, to estimate it. Attempts to deal with these problems have varied over time, from better education and treatment to more law enforcement and military response to legalization and decriminalization. So far, the results have been mixed and questions have emerged about the harms caused by the policies themselves, policies that attempt to restrict and limit access to drugs, especially narcotics. As Attorney General Eric Holder said recently in a speech before the ABA, um, as the so-called war on drug enters its fifth decade, we need to ask whether it and the, and the approaches that comprise it have been totally or truly effective. He went on to say, it's clear that too many Americans uh, go to uh, too many jails or prisons for too long and for not truly good law enforcement purposes. Widespread incarceration, Holder said, at the federal, state, and local levels is both ineffective and unsustainable. It imposes a significant economic burden, totaling $80 billion in 2010 alone, and it comes with human and moral costs that are impossible to calculate. End quote. As you'll see in the movie or the film that we're about to see, um, it takes a rather critical view of the war on drugs as a framework for dealing with the drug problem that is in this country and throughout the hemisphere and indeed throughout the world. It seeks to open a debate and dialogue about the usefulness of the war on drugs and suggests that a new framework is needed. While the Wilson Center has not taken a position on the war on drugs, we agree that a discussion about the policy is important. The dialogue underway both in the United States and in Latin America are particularly important and timely. We see this film and the discussion that will follow it with our panelists as another attempt to understand and grapple with what, are all, what we all agree are a serious and vexing problem. I hope you will join us, uh, stay with us after the film, and, and enter in a dialogue with us and our panelists uh, this afternoon. Um, we've invited two experts on the issue. Uh, first, Ambassador David Johnson, who is a former Assistant Secretary for International Narcotics and Law Enforcement at the Department of State and a member of the International uh, Narcotics Control Board. I'm just back from a meeting uh, there. Uh, and Pedro um, Abramovoy from the uh, Open Society Foundation, um, director of their Latin American and Caribbean program, former uh, member of the uh, Brazilian government, the Ministry of Justice, uh, under President Lula, and then subsequently under President uh, Rousseff. 
Um, he's not here at the moment. He had a conflict, but will join us after the film has been viewed and will participate in a dus discussion with us. So the film runs about 55 minutes, more or less, um, and I hope that you can not only enjoy it, but join us in the discussion afterwards. Thank you. Drug wars, they've been declared on local, regional, and national levels. We seize their heroin. 69 tons of marijuana. We are not going to allow the cartels to take over the United States. I have authorization to fire into your vessel. In 2011, a group of world leaders, including seven ex-presidents, set up the Global Commission on Drug Policy to end the 40-year war on drugs. But wars are easier to start than they are to finish. It's June 1971, and President Richard Milhouse Nixon is in a fighting mood. We must wage what I have called total war against public enemy number one in the United States, the problem of dangerous drugs. That was a time where you had both rising levels of sort of crime and there was more sort of agitation around civil rights and all of this. You also had the hippies and you had marijuana, you had the counterculture. And Richard Nixon saw himself as speaking for the silent majority, the silent middle class. The answer for a country already fighting one war in Vietnam? Another one, on drugs. To combat the number of Americans using illegal narcotics. What really tipped Nixon over was starting in 1970, there became a tremendous amount of intravenous heroin use in Vietnam, uh, and that really kicked him over. I shall soon propose a revision of the entire federal criminal code, which will give us tougher penalties against drugs and against crime. But the war on drugs would not be confined to the United States. In order to stem the production and supply of illegal narcotics, America has sought, even insisted upon, help from the rest of the world. The American government convinced the United Nations and the other governments that the, the main goal for United Nations would be in the, in the area of drugs to, to zero drugs, to, you know, to avoid any kind of drug. And secondly, that the instrument to get this goal was repression, war on drugs. The UN conventions on drugs amounted to a global ban on producing, transporting, selling, and possessing any drug classified as illegal. And it set in stone an attitude to narcotics that has lasted for decades. So in the crusade, for a drug-free America, the next step is to enforce a policy of zero tolerance of illegal drug use. So when we say no to drugs, it'll be clear that we mean absolutely none. Yet, in spite of the massive and sustained efforts of law enforcement, demand for illegal drugs has continued to rise. Heroin use spiked in the early 70s. Then there was cocaine. The government was completely unprepared for the explosive growth of the drug problems. I think we totally misunderstood cocaine. Originalmente Colombia era el país donde se procesaba, pero la producción estaba en Bolivia y en Perú. Después también se empezó a cultivar en Colombia y los carteles de la droga se fueron volviendo muy poderosos. America's insatiable appetite for cocaine made criminals like Pablo Escobar the richest and most powerful of all time. Escobar's cartel was smuggling 15 tons of cocaine a day into the U.S. and in 1989, Forbes magazine declared him the seventh richest man in the world, worth an estimated 25 billion. Cesar Gaviria was president of Colombia during the state's fight against Escobar. Escobar tenía una red clandestina muy grande 
era impresionantemente poderoso, la gente le tenía mucho temor. Más que corrupción, la gente le tenía, tenía intimidad a toda la sociedad. Escobar's policy of dealing with law enforcement was plata o plomo, a bribe or a bullet. And when the U.S. and Colombian governments finally took him on, the ensuing struggle made Colombia the murder capital of the world, with over 52,000 violent deaths in two years. And even the president wasn't immune. Una de estas organizaciones alimentada por el narcotráfico tuvo a mi hermano secuestrado bajo tierra sin poderse mover durante tres meses sin cambiarse la ropa, salió completamente traumatizado, paralizado. Fue una cosa muy traumática. Hace un par de años las FARC, que son hoy el, el principal cartel de droga de Colombia, mató a mi hermana tratando de, de secuestrarla para convertirla en un rehén y en una persona con la que pudieran hacer una, una, una negociación política. Y esto ocurre en todas las familias colombianas. O sea, todos han sido víctimas o de la guerrilla o del narcotráfico y esa guerrilla está cada vez alimentada por droga. Escobar was finally gone down by police in December of 1993. But America and Colombia's drug problems were to continue long after the downfall of El Patron. The death of Pablo Escobar and the working in the United States with Colombia to uh, get him out and killed uh, was a kind of uh, uh, boost to, the, to those efforts. But you know, I don't think anyone in the supply reduction area ever felt uh, that that was going to end the problem. Demand continued after Escobar's death, and so did supply. The next stage of the war on drugs was another large-scale attempt to wipe out the drugs at source, President Bill Clinton's Plan Colombia. What I tried to do was to focus on every aspect of the problem. I tried to empower the Colombians, for example, to do more militarily and police-wise, because I thought that they had to. 30% of their country was in the hands of the narco-traffickers. The U.S. spent billions of dollars funding military operations in Colombia to cut off the flow of cocaine into America by eradicating Colombia's coca plantations. Colombia is the only country in the world that fumiga aéreamente los cultivos de droga. It's a type of fumigation that destroys much of the cultivos aledaños. It's a war against people who try just to earn their living growing some plant. They would like to grow something else if they would receive the same money. So, I mean, you cannot make a war against drugs without knowing that doing so, you are making a war against people. Cuando el Plan Colombia empezó, había ocho departamentos donde había sembrados de coca. Hoy hay 24 o 28, alguna cosa así. Well, obviously, if the expected results were that we would have a eliminate serious drug use in America and eliminate the the narco trafficking networks, it hasn't worked. Today, the illegal drugs trade amounts to 320 billion dollars a year, and without laws or governments to regulate this underground market. Guns and violence have inevitably become the most effective method of control. Eu sei o quanto é perigoso ir de helicóptero algumas favelas. Você vai desviando, porque se acharem que é polícia, os traficantes atiram. As president of Brazil, Fernando Cardoso followed the prevailing thinking of his time and was a supporter of the war on drugs. On his watch, a new national anti-drug agency was established. Now, eight years later, as chair of the Global Commission on Drug Policy, Cardozo is back to see for himself what the fight against narcotics has done to favelas like these. Let me tell you very frankly, when I went to visit some of the favelas in a very violent part of Rio, I was a little bit afraid. I had no security because the precondition of being accepted into these neighborhoods is to go without guns. They have the guns, not me. Há 60 anos era 22, 32. 
a arma. É. é. Aí veio, há 40 anos já começou oitão, pistola, 12 de cano cerrado. Aí depois veio fuzil, metralhadora, HK, AK-47. E assim... Vem... Ou seja, para você faz uma ligação direta entre o tipo de arma, a entrada da arma e a, e a é. mudança do tráfego. É isso aí. Cada então, vez que mudava de um, 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 de um tipo de arma para o outro, era outro traficante, era outra pessoa, era outro... E isso era aumentava outra o, também a capacidade de venda e tal ou não? Aumentava mais a criminalidade. A criminalidade, né? a matança. A mais a matança. Moro numa localidade que estava tendo guerra entre facções rivais. Aí eu saí com a minha namorada, eu tinha ido a uma festa, foi a hora que aconteceu. Eu, eu tomei um tiro, não, não sei de onde, não vi de onde. As pessoas que pagam, as pessoas mesmo da comunidade que não tem nada a ver, sempre são. Acho que leva sempre a pior. Aí, fiquei desse jeito. Tinha 18, 19 anos. When I was uh, in favelas, what struck me was, first of all, the humanitarian situation, people. It's not difficult to understand how violence and use of drugs is, you know, devastating people. It's terrible. When I was in uh, office in Brazil, of course I was aware of the situation of drugs, but I was convinced that through repression it would be possible to stop the production of drugs. But I was wrong at the time. Yet the suffering experienced in Rio's favelas pales in comparison with the wave of violence unleashed in Mexico, where a battle for control of lucrative trafficking routes over the U.S. border has spiraled out of control. The Mexican president understood that the situation was very bad because of drug battles, and he decided to, you know, to confront. America's Merida Initiative, known to critics as Plan Mexico, has seen President Calderon spend over a billion dollars on the Mexican drug war since 2008. More than 50,000 soldiers and federal police are now actively involved in the fight against the cartels. But as in Colombia before it, the violence has exploded as the drug cartels fight against the police, the army, and each other. It's President Calderon's decision to declare war on the cartels back in 2006 and to use the army against them that I think has generated the violence. I think that the... the the war has created the situation. The situation did not create the war. The problem with this is that the Mexican military is not trained for this. It's not trained for police missions. And this is a police task. And you're asking it to fight a war it cannot win, and it knows it is not winning. And so the military go in and they shoot. That's what soldiers do. All of this has been going on now for four or five years, and it's getting worse and worse and worse. Since President Calderon declared his war on drugs in 2006, there have been over 47,000 drug-related murders in Mexico. And the cartels are increasingly targeting elected officials, journalists, and members of the justice system. The government is beginning to lose control of entire regions. Que este problema no lo vamos a resolver solo los mexicanos. Que los mexicanos debemos eh, reclamarle enérgicamente a los Estados Unidos y a los otros grandes países eh, consumidores que tomen una mayor responsabilidad en la solución de este tema. The United States has always led the war on drugs from the front, both at home and abroad. But five decades of an unyielding reliance on police enforcement and the fact that America remains the planet's largest consumer of illegal drugs has had a devastating effect on the land of the free. Using illegal drugs is against the law. 
Doing drugs, you risk everything, even your freedom. If you do drugs, you will be caught. And when you're caught, you will be punished. Some think there won't be room for them in jail. We'll make room. You know, think about the United States. We have less than 5% of the world's population, but almost 25% of the world's incarcerated population. Roughly about 2.3 million people behind bars tonight. Now, what's the number one thing driving that? It's the war on drugs. A kilo of pure cocaine costs $1,000 when it leaves a Colombian plantation. By the time it reaches the street in the U.S., it can be worth over $170,000. The illegality of drugs creates a situation where they're expensive. Now, if you're a wealthy person, then maybe you can afford your own addiction. But the vast majority of street users uh, resort to crime or prostitution or their own drug dealing to support their own addiction. A heavy user of heroin or cocaine has to spend up to 10 times more per week than a heavy user of alcohol or tobacco. It's not that cocaine, heroin, marijuana cost any more than alcohol or tobacco to produce. Think about it. If tomorrow people could get heroin or cocaine legally from a store, and tomorrow you could only get alcohol or cigarettes from the black market, then all of a sudden very few people would be committing crimes in order to support their heroin or cocaine habit, and lots of people would be committing crimes to support their alcohol or tobacco habit. What the war on drugs has done is just it's created this massive prison industrial complex in America. In 1970, there were about 330,000 prisoners in the U.S. Now there are 2.3 million, and we somehow consider that normal. 2.3 million prisoners is more than any other country in the history of the world ever. We have more prisoners than China, and they have a billion more people than we do. Um, we have more prisoners than soldiers, but there are more prison guards than there are U.S. Marines. This level of incarceration has just taken on a life of its own. We know that people can be rehabilitated, but the truth is most of these people who are minor offenders who get sent to prisons get no rehabilitation. If you didn't have a drug habit going in, you leave going with a drug habit. There was so much drugs in prison, it was unbelievable. You could get any kind of drug you want in prison. If you can't control drug use in a maximum security prison, how could you control drugs in a free society? We need look no further than Washington's own doorstep to see the effect that the drug war is having on whole regions of America. In 1950, Baltimore City had over a million inhabitants. Today, there are just over half that number. There are 50,000 derelict buildings, and almost 10% of the residents are addicted to an illegal drug. I can remember the night that my sister was burned. My mother's house caught fire. It was a result of my youngest brother being high for heroin. So um, she lived for three weeks, and she died. And um, that night that we buried her, a friend of the family came past, and um, he told me, um, he said, here, he said, try this. And I said, what is that? He said, just try it, it'll make you feel better. It was like this warm feeling just went through my whole body. And it was like, where has this been all my life? You know, and what it was, it was, it was heroin. I think before I realized it was a problem, it was like years had went past. I lost everything. I would go in department stores and, and I was still. And I got locked up a, a couple of times. By the time I had got to that point, I was really tired, you know. I wanted a way out, but I didn't know how, you know, or, or what I was gonna do to stop. 
There are 600,000 people in this city. In 2007, there were 100,000 arrests. The numbers are staggering when you begin to think about what that means for people. If you have a criminal conviction, generally you are excluded from any support um, for housing. You are excluded for support for education, and you're not able to get an ever-increasing array of jobs because of your conviction. The reality is that you return to the drug trade. And the drug trade begins to occupy entire communities. In the neighborhood I policed, men who are born there have about a 12% chance of getting murdered in their lifetime. It seems like uh, these problems are far more important than some sort of futile goal of creating a drug-free society. People should care more about all these deaths, and, and by and large, the vast majority are related to prohibition. We could have fighting and killing over cigarettes if we made it a felony to sell a cigarette or smoke one. So we legalized it. If all you do is try to find a, a police or military solution to the problem, a lot of people die and it doesn't solve the problem. But repressive drug policies and their grave consequences stretch far beyond the Americas. Amid the chaos of war, Afghanistan has emerged as the main producer of heroin in the world. Afghanistan has become like the Walmart of dope. The quantities of drugs that are moving out of Afghanistan regularly are simply colossal. They are unimaginable. They make the quantities that Pablo Escobar moved look like child's play. A major uh, use of the enormous profits from the production of poppies and therefore heroin goes to the Taliban to finance their illicit operations in subjugating people and in punishing people. But U.S.-led efforts to cut off Taliban funding by eradicating the poppy crops have in fact driven farmers into the arms of the insurgents. In this incredibly insecure, lethally uncertain environment, the one crop that they could depend on to bring in enough money to live off, the United States came in to help destroy that. And of course, once they had lost their source of livelihood, they were then much more open to being persuaded by a Taliban recruitment officer he had to take a rifle, take some dollars for the day, and go and shoot at British, American, Afghan soldiers. It really just contributed massively to getting us to where we are today in Afghanistan, the mess that we have today. Go, go, go! We're gonna cut just cut round, really. The thing that sticks in my mind was a direct order to find pictures of burning opium. How can any military task involve being taking a picture of burning opium? And I think it is indicative of who was requesting this. This was someone whose prime motivation was counter-narcotics rather than the counterinsurgency campaign or the benefit and well-being of the people of Afghanistan. Under the Obama administration, the official counter-narcotics policy in Afghanistan has shifted away from eradication. But with the announcement that U.S. and NATO troops will be withdrawn in 2014, calls for widespread eradication of the poppy are growing, and not only from the West. С коллапсом Советского Союза проблема наркопотребления пошла в гору. На эту тенденцию наложился рост наркопроизводства, взрывной рост наркопроизводства в Афганистане с 2001 года. Russia wants to take serious action and has been very vocal in the last year calling for a wide-scale eradication program in Afghanistan. They find it inconceivable that the United States thinks that the biggest threat emanating from Afghanistan is terrorism. They say the biggest threat emanating from Afghanistan is narcotics. And Russian policymakers of today look backwards to the repressive example set by the United States in the 1990s. США имеет 
завершила реализацию так называемого «План Колумбия», в соответствии с которым было у них соглашение с, между США и Колумбией по вопросам как эрадикации посевов, уничтожения лабораторий и иным мероприятиям, направленным на искоренение наркопроизводства. Мне кажется, это хороший опыт Соединенных Штатов Америки, который нам, России, следовало бы самым активным образом применять на практике. In 2010, U.S. and Russian forces took part in a joint raid on a drug lab in Afghanistan. And Russia's influence in Afghanistan's war on drugs continues to grow. As we leave a transition, which will be delicate enough anyway, if in that window of opportunity of transition, those who wish to push the um, counter-narcotics agenda get their way, and we do see a short, sharp attempt to eradicate poppy, I think that will spell disaster for the country. And a return to the destructive anarchy that spawned 9-11 and what we came here to rectify. Get on the ground, now! Now, now! Old orthodoxies persist on how to best deal with the supply of narcotics. So how has the war on drugs dealt with the demand? This is drugs. This is your brain on drugs. During the time I was in Congress, we tried almost everything we could think of. We got corporations to donate an enormous amount of money to go into public advertising, hard-hitting advertisements that showed kids the terrible things that would happen with drugs. Toda a propaganda anti-droga da minha época era baseada no fato de que a droga destruía o ser humano. That had a problem because most of the people who were using drugs weren't dead and they liked to use the drugs and so it had a credibility problem. You're gonna die if you mess with dope. Nobody can handle it. Take a look at the nearest junkie and figure it out. E aí, o jovem questiona toda, uh, todo o discurso que ele ouviu até então. Hey kiddies, gather around. The man with the goodies is here. Dig everybody. L. Então nesse momento fica claro que há uma hipocrisia generalizada na campanha de drogas, normalmente feita por pessoas que nunca experimentou a droga. Então, essas pessoas vêm com esse discurso moralista, conservador, e acham que vão impressionar muita gente, não vão. Come on, one drag won't hurt you. That's not what I heard. I heard it can really mess you up. I heard wrong. Come on, give it a try. It's cool. You don't know what you're doing. Besides, smoking pot's illegal. Or maybe you're just a little the too The moralization scared. of these campaigns produced a polarization between the users and the believers of the campaign messages who believe that anyone who uses a drug is an addict and a criminal. And politicians have fallen into this trap too. You point your finger at our generation and you say, well, you had alcohol, you had martinis and so forth, and that was your crutch. Well, maybe so. But then what makes you so much more noble by just deciding to have a different kind of crutch? I'd like to see a generation that didn't have any crutch at all. Today, a generation after President Reagan left office, the UN estimates there are 230 million drug users in the world. 90% of them are not classified as problematic. And yet the question of how to deal with these people has divided politicians ever since President Nixon first declared his war on drugs. Nixon's attitude about drugs was very interesting. His instincts were all uh, law enforcement, all punishment, no sympathy, but a very uh, strong commitment to dealing with the problem. Nixon said, I could say anything I wanted to say about drugs except one thing, I couldn't support decriminalization of marijuana. He said he was elected president, not me, and if, if I came out and supported decriminalization, I was history. 60% of the Berkeley voters approved the marijuana ordinance. It specifically told the Berkeley police not to make marijuana arrests without first getting city council approval. Decriminalization was the permissive pole of drug policy, and it said essentially that there would be no criminal penalty for possession of marijuana. And we had a presidential commission to look at this issue. Nixon appointed the people, and they came out and supported it. We have made several recommendations to the Congress, to the President, and to the American people. The federal recommendations are as follows. First, possession for personal use is no longer a criminal offense. Second, 
non-profit distribution of small amounts should no longer be a criminal offense. So Nixon dissociated himself from the commission report that he'd put together, and he just said, that's not going to happen on my watch. But Nixon ultimately had bigger issues to worry about than the war on drugs. It was the Watergate scandal, not narcotics, that was his undoing. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Vice President Ford will be sworn in as president at that hour in this office. So Nixon is gone and Ford is there. He doesn't have this guidance for me. So I came out and supported decriminalization. Uh, and I was a poster drug czar for decriminalization at that point. With the election of Jimmy Carter in 1977, decriminalization found itself at the forefront of the mainstream political agenda. An end to the war on drugs was in sight. When I was president, we had the same problem with drug production and distribution and consumption that we presently face. We tried as best we could to uh, minimize the emphasis on uh, criminal punishment. And I made a major statement to the U.S. Congress asking for changes in the law. And decriminalization spread to 10 U.S. states by 1979. And it will look like the future. It looked like that things were going to go that direction. Then the parents' movement came in, and it stopped, and nobody decriminalized again. Under the Reagan administration, a hardline policy of zero tolerance reignited the drug war and would entrench political attitudes for years to come. President Reagan and his wife adopted the drug program as the number one issue for her to proclaim. She had a phrase, just say no. Just say no so loud that everyone around you can hear. And if you do that, drugs won't stand a chance. And she made it clear that her prohibition against uh, drugs included marijuana and everything else. So I don't think there's any doubt that President Reagan made a profound impact then on the uh, consciousness of our country, and I, I think he also shaped the opinion of many members of our Congress. The truth is the vast majority of members of Congress still take a very hard position on drugs. We're against legalizing drugs. We want tougher penalties for drug users and particularly for people who sell and traffic in the drugs. We want to maintain the long terms, the prison terms and penalties that are there. In 2009, there were 1.6 million drug-related arrests in the U.S. 1.3 million of these were for possession of drugs alone, and over half were related to marijuana. I personally fully disagree with the U.S. saying that they are being successful just because they have more people in jail or they have more sentences against traffickers than they had 20 or 10 or 5 years ago. That is not a good way to say that a policy is successful. This project over the past 22 months has led to the arrest of more than 2,200 individuals. We seized their heroin, taken their money. 41 kilograms of cocaine. $154 million in the United States currency. It's every year the same. They are showing some data, and the data shows more people in prison. We are destroying more plantations of, of, of uh, cocaine, so on and so forth. If they had less violence and less consumption, and well, that would be a success. But what they have now, and the measure of success they have, is wrong. We have spent hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars on the war on drugs, which has been a complete, total failure. The problem is that politicians are basically unwilling to spend political capital on this issue, as they know it's unpopular with the public and the media. What is his position, as you understand, on drug use? Apparently he has a somewhat libertarian view on that subject, which you, I think, are arguing is not a Kentucky view. I had a senior law enforcement official tell me that in his judgment, up to a quarter of the White House staff, when they first came in, had used drugs in the last four or five years. Accusations about the use of illegal drugs are flying around the Democratic presidential campaign again. What we have in this issue is similar to what we have in pornography. This is chemical pornography. The allegation is that while governor, he hosted parties where drugs were used a violation of state law. Most politicians, they're afraid of what 
the political ads will be that their opponents will run in the upcoming election. They're afraid of being accused of being soft on crime or soft on drugs. And that's why oftentimes the politicians lag behind the public. Why? Because the politicians are still stuck. The party's over. The party's over for drug dealers. We can change the status quo. We can win the war. But we've got to start the war on drugs. The U.S. just ignores the problem. In this society, it's almost prohibited, banned to talk about the problem. So you have to break taboo. In 2011, the Global Commission on Drug Policy set out to correct the mistakes of the past and change the very nature of the war on drugs. Um, I'm not proposing to replace war by peace. I propose to replace war by a smarter fight, a fight using other instruments, more intelligent instruments to convince people not to use drugs. So break the taboo and bring in the public debate what experiences in some countries could help to find better solutions. Portugal has a brave new approach to the drug problem. In 2001, they decriminalized the use of all drugs, meaning that users would no longer face criminal punishment for possession alone. To see the progress made in Portugal is astonishing, because in Portugal, they decided to decriminalize the use of all kinds of drugs, and not just marijuana. They decriminalized, people do not go to prison, do not go to court even, but there's a penalty that can be applied, and there's a clear sign of disapproval for drug use. If someone is arrested with drugs in Portugal, they are not taken to court. Instead, they are brought before a dissuasion board made up of psychiatrists and social workers. The main concern is to understand what are the needs of that people intercepted by police forces uh, using drugs or carrying drugs for personal use, and what do they need? What, uh, what kind of help can we provide? The most fundamental step we need to take is to realize that addiction is a medical problem and therefore addicts need to be treated medically not criminally. If we accept that basic principle we overcome most of the disagreements about drug policy. In Portugal after decriminalization the prevalence of drug use among youngsters has declined in the last, in the, in the last decade uh, of every illicit drug. In 1997, drug addiction was officially the number one political concern in Portugal. Now, after a decade of decriminalization, the issue has fallen as far down as 13th and hardly registers on the political agenda. And even more radical steps have been taken elsewhere. In the 90s, Switzerland faced an AIDS epidemic rapidly spreading through the heroin-using population. It was clear in Switzerland that repression was not the way, that repression was a part of the problem, that repression was a cause of the dissemination of AIDS, that uh, repression was a cause of uh, the deaths of young people by overdoses. As president, Global Commissioner Ruth Dreyfus called for a series of dramatic solutions to the epidemic, including medically prescribing clean needles and heroin to addicts who couldn't kick the habit. How can you speak with people about the problem of drugs if they are addicts, if they are under the threat to be arrested? It's absolutely clear that you have to go to the people, and in order to go to the people, you have to accept in a certain way the people as they are. In Switzerland, the number of injecting drug users with HIV AIDS has been reduced by over 50% in 10 years. And the model of putting health before punishment is gathering momentum. I think there should be safe places where people who have addiction could come and not think they're going to be arrested and will have basic needs met. I have experience with this, including personal experience. I had a brother who was addicted to cocaine. So I know a lot about this. Uh, and uh, I understand more than most people do what is involved. Well, dealing with human beings, so we are not just dealing with criminals. The users, very often, they want to, to escape from the situation. They have no instruments. So why not to give a lift to them? Who are the addicts? Our, our children. 
I mean, people we, we love, people we would like really to bring back in the normal life. The American experience with alcohol prohibition provides a wonderful analogy for the problems that we're experiencing today with drug prohibition. By the end of alcohol prohibition, more people were drinking alcohol than at the beginning of alcohol prohibition. And at the same time, you now created Al Capone and organized crime and violence and corruption and young people looking up to bootleggers as role models and shootouts and violence in the streets. You look what's going on in Mexico today or Central America or the Caribbean, it's almost like Chicago during the days of Al Capone and Prohibition times 50. So, so much today of what people identify as part and parcel of the drug problem are in fact the results of our failed prohibitionist policies. A drug-free world is a fantasy. The war on drugs didn't do away with people's desire for drugs. All it managed to create was a network of criminal supply routes to fulfill the demand. In 2005, the UN estimated that criminals were trading more than $320 billion a year on the illegal drug market. The UN estimates that almost 50% of organized crime's profits come from the drug trade. Eliminating this source of revenue would be a devastating blow to criminal cartels. I am sure that regulation by the state with very clear uh, limitation is the solution. And then, of course, there are the financial benefits of regulation to consider. The saving on police and incarceration and the profits of taxation. In 2008, Harvard economist Jeffrey Myron estimated that regulating and taxing drugs would inject over $76 billion a year into the U.S. economy alone. So imagine if we could turn this thing around across the board and instead of wasting hundreds of billions of dollars a year, putting those hundreds of billions into the hands of criminals, bringing in the tax revenue instead, what a tremendous savings at a time when so many governments are facing really gross fiscal problems. A country that has already moved in this direction is Holland, where it is in practice legal to buy and sell small quantities of cannabis in coffee shops. Today, ex-Brazilian President Fernando Cardoso has come to see this for himself. You are not allowed to advertise cannabis. You are not allowed to sell any hard drugs. You are not allowed to sell cannabis to people under 18 years old. You're allowed to have only 500 grams in stock as a coffee shop and uh, don't sell more than five grams a day to, a one, day. A day to one person. The good thing about the business in soft drugs and cannabis in the coffee shop is that it's without any violence. And what have been the consequences regarding the users? Well, people might think that it would have led to a sharp increase in cannabis use yeah. because in practice it's free available yeah. cannabis. Uh, but you will see, if you look at the statistics, that the, the consumption is quite comparable with surrounding countries. In spite of Holland's liberal cannabis laws, consumption rates are lower than in surrounding countries like France, Germany, Denmark, and the UK. But would a legally regulated market open itself to big business like alcohol and tobacco did in the past? So refreshing. Winston takes good night to church. Change to Winston, you'll change for good. Cause Winston tastes good like a cigarette should. Look, no one wants their drugs free for all. We need to regulate and control how drugs are produced and sold. No advertising, no selling to minors, labeling dangers. And in fact, tobacco policy today actually shows how effective regulation and good education can be. 
We need to regulate drugs the same way we regulate normal cigarettes. In many ways, those are great success stories. We've reduced use by half over a generation or two. Um, that's, if we could do that with heroin and cocaine, that would be a great victory. The fact of the matter is, when a drug is really dangerous, smart education and smart regulations can reduce use very, very substantially. E aí você tem que ser honesto na sua abordagem. Seja aberto, seja honesto. Diga isso. É realmente a droga é fantástica. Você vai gostar. Mas cuidado, hein? Porque você não vai poder decidir mais nada. Basta isso, basta isso. O grande perigo da droga é que ela, ela mata a coisa mais importante que você vai precisar na vida. É o teu poder de decidir. A única coisa que você tem na sua vida é o seu poder de decisão. Don't be drug free because it's illegal. Be drug free because it's the key to your freedom. It's the key to your future. After a year of investigation, the Global Commission gathers in New York to present its findings to the world. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the press conference of the Global Commission on Drug Policy. The fact is that the war on drugs is a failure. The consumption is not being reduced. It's cost millions of dollars. The increasing number of people in jail is, is there in the statistics. And it's fueled organized crime worldwide. Stop the war on drugs. And let's be more constructive in trying to reduce the consumption. But the strategy of drug prohibition has failed, according to the Global Commission on Drug Policy, an admission by world leaders, including four former presidents, a prime minister, and a former UN Secretary General. organized crime and cost billions of dollars. drug policy has failed. The most striking thing about the Global Commission is the media reaction to it. My God, it's off the scale. It's everywhere. The message of the Global Commission came in the right moment and allowed a certain crystallization around this call for breaking the taboo all over the world. But it is not just the media that reacts. The White House also has something to say. When the Global Commission came out with its statement, I could have predicted in advance exactly what the drugs are was going to say. We have spoken about our opposition to legalizing drugs because we know that legalizing drugs is not an answer. We also know... I think essentially the role of the drug czar in America today is to refrain from any substantive debate about what's wrong with drug policy today. It's to point their fingers at the little signs of progress and ignore all the signs of failure. It's to make sure that this issue doesn't blow up one way or another for the president the incarceration approach to drugs. In 2004, Senator Obama described the war on drugs as an utter failure. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear. As president, however, he has not implemented substantial change, with funding for law enforcement still almost twice that allocated for treatment and prevention. It was not a surprise to see the resistance, because governments have to be more conservative. It's difficult for governments to change. They are afraid because of vote. They don't want to innovate. And the world requires more innovation. And the fact that now ministers and important personalities are joining us is a signal of progress. There are dozens, if not hundreds, including people in power today who think the same way and don't feel the confidence, the political confidence, the personal confidence to speak out. But when you see this group of such distinction, people who left offices with their reputations intact, people who are oftentimes globally known, standing up and saying enough is enough, that hopefully can embolden others to say the same thing. In 2011, President Santos of Colombia became the first serving president to break the silence and publicly declare that the world needs to look for new solutions. Colombia has been fighting uh, drugs and the drug cartels for 40 years. But the business is still going on. And sometimes uh, I feel like uh, in a, a static bicycle. You, you work hard, you work hard, and then you suddenly look to your right, look to your left, and you're almost in the same place. And uh, you see what happens uh, in Mexico and Guatemala. And so I think a new approach uh, or at least uh, to try to open up, to break the taboo, 
is what the world should do. There are many alternatives, including the possibility of legalizing drugs. Politically, I know that this has cost, and I have already incurred those costs. They have attacked me uh, for saying what I am saying to you. Uh, but uh, I don't think uh, politicians or leaders of any country can only uh, say what uh, people want to hear. In Latin America, there is a growing concern. Before, this was a taboo, and you have to break this taboo, and the taboo has been broken. Now, for the first time in four decades, the countries that have suffered most from this war on drugs are talking back and initiating their own reforms unilaterally. You have a situation where Latin American leaders of great stature in their countries, great stature in the world, can go to the United States and say, look, this is not working, let's do something else. Estamos poniendo en la mesa un tema de debate. Ya fue una propuesta del presidente Cardoso, ya una propuesta del presidente eh, Gaviria de Colombia y que ahí ha estado. Y lo que queremos es traerlo nuevamente al debate. For the first time in history, at the 2012 Summit of the Americas, it was announced that investigating alternative drug policies would become part of the official regional agenda. The truth is that the war on drugs is a war fought inside the heart and mind of everybody who thinks of using them. But I know that lives can be saved, that they're worth saving, that it's never too late to start. And as long as you have your personal freedom, the ability to think, you have a chance to do better. Don't give that freedom up. That's my message. I'm not uh, going to put unrealistic. I know that it's difficult to change, but I know also the society do change. It will depend largely on people, on civil society. We are now at the beginning of a new phase where the public debate will be possible. And I'm sure that will help to change the policy, not only in the US, but also in the world. It depends heavily on people's pressure for governments to change. All together, we are breaking the taboo on drugs. Okay, thank you all. Oh, I can't see. Oh, here you he go. Just in the nick of time, our other <laughs> house. How are you? Uh, yeah. Come on. David Johnson. Uh, nice to meet you. Well, great. Um, thank you all. Um, <coughs> oh, my gosh. Foreign Minister Fernando Carrera from uh, Guatemala has joined us. We'll ask you to say something in a minute, if that's okay. Or do you want to say something now? No, 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 no. Please go. Oh, Just please. You're at the audience. <laughs> uh -huh. I had no idea you were going to join us. And I uh, just wanted to recognize uh, Don Francisco Tumi, also a uh, well-known scholar and, and, and uh, researcher and a member of the International Narcotics Control Board. And, participant in the OAS process, uh, uh, writing the report, as, as I, if, if I'm correct about that, right? Former fellow. And a former fellow at the, at the, uh, <laughs> at the Woodrow Wilson Center as well. Um, and then Cindy Arnson, uh, the director of the uh, Woodrow Wilson Center's Latin America program. Thank you all for, for being with us. Um, so we've seen the film, and I wanted to just start off with a little bit of a discussion with two experts in the field. Um, uh, here on my left is uh, Pedro Abramovi, 
from uh, the Open Society Foundation, uh, director of their Latin American and Caribbean program, but also a uh, former official in the government of Brazil and the Ministry of Justice, um, very active on a number of issues related to human rights. Uh, I was reminded that you played a role in the issue of firearms in Brazil. They, there was some good pictures of uh, the warehouses of firearms that were taken off the streets mm -hmm. of uh, Rio, uh, and I know that you were instrumental in that. Um, played a role in the, the administration of President Lula, uh, and was actually nominated as the drug czar, I don't know the exact title, for President uh, Rousseff, uh, and uh, now is with us here in, in Washington for a while, and eventually will move back to Brazil. Thank you very much for, for your work. Um, and then uh, a friend for many years, um, uh, and often uh, we chat when he comes here to our events, but Ambassador David Johnson, uh, former uh, Assistant Secretary of State for International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs at the State Department, um, uh, former, uh, well, a member, as I've said, of the International Narcotics Control Board, uh, a former Charge de Affair in, in, in the U.S. Embassy in London, coordinator for Afghanistan, so has that experience as well, and ambassador to the uh, Organization for Security and e uh, Cooperation of Euro in Europe. So we have a panel with a lot of experience in these issues, and uh, I thought I would ask them each a couple questions and then open it up for your all's uh, participation and comments obviously on the, um, on the uh, uh, movie as well. Uh, suddenly. <laughs> I hope you could hear that first part. Um, so I think I'm going to start with Pedro. We just saw this movie. You've seen it uh, before. Um, and and uh, ask you how uh, the, the issue of the war on drugs uh, is really being experienced now because this movie is uh, you know a year too old there's been a lot of new developments in the region a lot of discussion about this um, do you things do you see things really changing or is it still <laughs> very much at a discussion level uh, and really hasn't had any impact on the people sure I think there are uh, first of all thank you very much for, for this invitation and, and it's really a pleasure to, to debate this uh, subject here. I think there is a, a, a very, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the title of the, the film uh, talks about maybe the most important thing that we have to discuss, that is the fact that the idea of taboo, I mean, the, the, the idea that the drug, uh, drug policy in general has been seen as a, as a taboo. Uh, something that it was really hard to talk about, to discuss, to discuss in a democratic uh, 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 pattern. So uh, the idea that only one solution towards drugs was possible, and uh, the solution was the war on drugs. The fact that we had uh, United Nations documents that said that it was that uh, the, uh, the the goal of the community of nations would be uh, to have a world free of drugs, which appears now to uh, almost uh, uh, everyone that is debating the team something that is impossible. And establishing impossible goals is, is something that is not useful to, to solve any problem. So uh, I think the idea of uh, the taboo that was uh, um, avoiding a debate that, was, uh, that would allow people to discuss concrete solutions and not only procedural and uh, intermediate solutions. I think one thing that the film, if I uh, recall right, uh, uh, discussed is the fact that all the, all the uh, indicators of success when we talk about drug policy are normally related to process and not to, to final goals. So states that will present results would say uh, would, uh, how much drugs were seized or how much uh, uh, people were arrested or in some states how much people were killed in this war. And it doesn't relate to health. It doesn't relate to security. There are the issues, issues that should be the, the main concern. So I think what this film's changed, it was a really important thing. And I mean, relating the time when the film was issued and a little bit before, 
where we had this taboo where it was impossible to debate these things. I think about broader goals uh, and, and different alternatives. I think we are in a moment now where debate is, uh, uh, the debate is, is allowed. We can debate, we can uh, discuss the theme. There is an environment where uh, somebody that has an alternative uh, uh, thinking on it is not, will not be tagged at something that is, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, should be put a, a away from the debate. I think this is different. In terms of policies, I think uh, not much have changed in the last uh, uh, years. Of course, there is the Uruguayan experience that, I mean, it doesn't, I mean, it's, it's just, uh, uh, it's yet been debated uh, on, on the Congress, Colorado and Washington here, uh, that it will begin uh, next year. So, of course, there is something changing, in, but if you, if you look at, at a general level, I think the policies are much the same, but the debate has completely changed, and I think this is a very good thing. We had, uh a couple of U.S. officials come here over the last few months. One was uh, Director Kurlikowski, the, the uh, White House Director of National Drug Control Policy, and uh, your successor, uh, uh, Ambassador uh, Bill Brownfield. And, and, both, a, and a great improvement. And a great improvement. No, I don't know about that. Uh, but both of them sort of said very clearly, especially Kurlikowski, that the war in, on drugs is over that it's no longer the framework for the United States policy. Um, sometimes I wonder if we're still stuck in some old paradigm <coughs> that we haven't uh, been able to get out of. And, and the discussion about how things are changing in reality hasn't caught up. Do you share that? Do you, do you feel like this process of talking about the war on drugs is really uh, missing the boat in some way? Or is that really the paradigm? No, I think uh, uh, this, uh, this statement and several statements in this direction that were made uh, reveals exactly what I was talking about, about the change in the speech that is clear in the, in the way things are debated. It's really, it, it's still hard to, to hear uh, um, in some countries people talking about war on drugs. But first of all, we have a lot of countries where this is still the, the speech uh, um, throughout the world. And we, ha we have a reality where People still, and if we look, for example, Latin America, uh, that is seen as a, as a region where the debate is changing, where we have presidents and uh, former presidents that are debating differently the, the theme. The reality is we have many users that are being arrested because they're drug consumers. We have yet many... Uh, 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 the, the general approach in the region is not the health approach. It's clearly an approach based on uh, um, law enforcement and, and even, I would say, uh, uh, with the ideology of the, the war on drugs. So I think we, we still have to pass from this change in the, in the speech from a, a real change in the way the policies are implemented. Thank you. Um, David, you know, um, this makes a very compelling and strong argument that the war on drugs has been a failure. Um, consumption has not gone down necessarily. There's more violence, more people are in jail, but things aren't improved. Um, is there a nuance to that? Is there something about that that you uh, think they've missed in this story that you would like to highlight for us? Um, first of all, a disclaimer. I'm, I'm speaking for myself sure, today and, and, and not for the board. Absolutely. The president gets to do that and not <laughs> any of the rest of us, so <laughs> right. I, I want to make that clear. Um, I, I have to say I found the film, as, a, as a, an aficionado of the Shawshank Redemption, I like to believe everything that comes out of Morgan Freeman's <laughs> mouth, but I, I found the film kind of overly simplistic and I found it overly American-centric when talking about this very difficult issue. Uh, and I think when, when you start down that road, you start to lead to some conclusions which I, I think uh, don't bear up under, under much uh, scrutiny. And, and one is that were we to radically change uh, from a, a supply reduction model that, is, that has been the focus of the last uh, several decades um, and only have an exclusively demand reduction model through education and health and, and things of that nature, something that I think uh, candidly has, has mushroomed in the last uh, eight or 10 years. Uh, and it's, re it's really thought of now as, as a chronic dis disease model. 
I think if you leap to the conclusions that are set forth in the premises in this film, you would expect that American jails would empty, uh, that the social problems of the uh, United States and the hemisphere would go away, that the questions of international law which are brought by this would suddenly disappear. And I don't think any of those things would happen. So I think it's, it's important to be honest about this and you should debate this issue based on its merits. Would it improve or would it not improve the health of the, of the world? Uh, and, and stay with that uh, because I don't think you should expect it radically to change a lot of the things that are brought out here and suggested to be the direct result of drug policies over the last four or five decades. Uh, American society, world society has gone through a lot of changes over the last several decades. Uh, the rate of, uh, of murder, if you, you saw in the statistics just in the last week in, uh, in newspapers about how they'd, they'd fallen off radically since about 1970 and 80. I don't think they're really due so much to the fact that the United States has engaged in a, an enormous investment in supply reduction over that period of time or the rest of the world has. I think there, there are enormous social changes taking place. So I think it's important to try to separate these things out a little bit. Uh, and I think it's important to think about this issue about drugs as to whether it would in fact improve health and safety. And tobacco is often thought of as a model. In fact, it was introduced several times in the film. Um, and I, I think that the United States is better off with the tobacco policy that it has now than it did when I was a child and you would have expected me to be a smoker. But you still have to bear in mind that about 20 to 25 percent of adults in the United States smoke tobacco and it is largely a disease of poverty with the types of constraints that are on now. I don't think there's any real reason to expect the incidence to drop in a, an environment where it was there would be no legal constraints on uh, the, the ability to purchase and use drugs. So I think you, you, you should look at these constraints much as you would pricing in an economic model. So notwithstanding what the Dutch gentleman said, and I have a bit of a question about his, his specifics, but I think you should expect as the price of this commodity falls, you should expect consumption to rise unless it is radically different than anything, any other economic good that uh, humankind has ever enjoyed. So I think you have to be prepared to deal with that. And if you're gonna walk in that direction, you need to be prepared to deal with those sorts of consequences. Maybe there are ways to help repress the demand through other things, through education, that sort of stuff. But I don't think, uh, as in the tobacco model, we've, we've pushed it down a lot, but we think we've pretty much re reached an irreducible minimum at this point. It's not falling off, and in fact, it's trickling up a little bit. Mm -hmm. so, so you should be careful when you start drawing the kind of broad conclusions that are suggested in this film would be all the wonderful things that would flow from a change in policy. Um, and uh, finally, well, I, I think if I were the uh, public affairs guy who was trying to push this idea as something for discussion, taboo sounds awfully good. But this is not a taboo. I mean, incest is a taboo, pornography, child pornography is a taboo. But this, this is something that's been discussed uh, broadly for the last several decades. And this is something that, that's not just emerging because of the, uh, the recent uh, discussions by, by the Global Commission. It sounds like there's a, you know, uh, a sense that there should be a debate about this and that there are elements about the current policy that don't work, but there are elements that do or are useful to hold on to and not just throw uh, the whole policy out or think simplistically that legalization will take care of all problems. Is that? I think this is a very complicated issue, and, and to suggest that legalization solves all problems, uh, I think is is, uh, is 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 not it doesn't bear up under scrutiny. I think one of the issues that is kind of nudged up against in this film, but isn't dire addressed directly, and that is something that I think is a break point, and and if if you will, is pretty close to a taboo, um, and that is, would you provide this substance to people medically in order to maintain their habit? Or would you engage in a program that would try to wean them off of it over time? And that, that is the, the Swiss think that maintenance is just fine. The Portuguese 
are extraordinarily interventionists on this. And uh, the type of work that they do with individuals who use drugs, I mean, really dwarfs anything that's done in the United States. I mean, you are, you can't escape from the social pressures in, in Portugal that not to use these substances. It, it is the, the social structure comes down on you in a, in a very profound way. And I think that's something that's not fully understood when people think of, of Portugal and its approach to, to this issue. Let's open it up for others' questions here. But Pedro, I'll give you a chance. Is there anything else you'd like to add on this um, as we oh. entered into the discussion? Oh, I think uh, uh, just to, to stick a little bit in the discussion, of course, we could discuss what what is a taboo. Uh, but I think what has been uh, a fact in this case is that um, the perspective of discussing alternatives or testing alternatives were uh, in many countries, uh, 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 I mean, impossible because there was one and one uh, only approach that was allowed uh, to emerge in the debate. And I'm, I mean, of course, uh, if the debate uh, is being American-centered, I can remember uh, the case of Brazil, that is a consolidated democracy, where for years the march of marijuana was forbidden by the judiciary because we couldn't the debate the time. It was forbidden to debate or to be pro-legalization in a consolidated democracy as uh, Brazil is. And after five years of discussion the judiciary, the Supreme Court ruled that, of course, uh, it was possible. But the, the only fact that you have some area of the, dem of, you know, the democratic debate that people in, in a consolidated democracy as Brazil is uh, are forbidden to protests or to rely uh, on it, I think shows that there is something else on the, the way the debate was framed uh, in the democratic societies around drugs that has been changed. And I think it's very positive. And I think as a result of it, we are seeing now alternative mo models emerging. And I totally agree that uh, we'll have to test, we have to evaluate, and we have to see if uh, health, freedom, security, and other issues are better. Of course, all the problems won't be solved, but we have to evaluate and see, are li people's life better or worse in different models than the only model that we had uh, uh, in the whole world like uh, uh, 10 years ago? I mean, in some ways, the, the, the experiment, if I can use that word, in, 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 in Washington and Colorado and Uruguay are big enough to be meaningful but small enough not to, yeah. uh, you know, uh, cause major problems if something were to go wrong. It seems like it's an, a real opportunity to, to look at some of these. I, I just think that, uh, well, things are going wrong. And uh, I think that uh, I, many times in, in Uruguay people say, well, so why should we take this risk uh, in Uruguay? And I, I, I think the risk is uh, letting things the way they are in terms of drug policy. And I think it's really, really, uh, uh, I mean, taking risk maybe is the most safer thing that one could do in this area. Good. All right, let's open it up. We have a few minutes here for questions, comments. Uh, we have one right there next to Cindy. I'm, I apologize, I can't really see people very well because of these lights, but. Sandra uh, Martinez. Oh, Sandra <laughs> Martinez, I'm sorry. All right, we'll get another mic. <laughs> that ONOFF switch will get you every time. All right. Well, go ahead and I loudly. think we. All right. Sandra Martinez, uh, with Team of Leadership and Development. Um, Ambassador Johnson, you are urging us to really examine the relationship that we're assuming the impact of our non recovery policy. Um, for those of us that are really uh, concerned about the situation, the rising violence, in the Northern Triangle, for example, um, we have some foundation to believe that would be an impact of the violence would be um, considerably decreased if there was a legalization of drugs in the, in the country that contains you know, the, the highest degree of drugs. Great. We have a question here. Is it, is it working, Allison? Yes, it is. Yeah, I had a, when I saw this movie, is it on? Yeah, yeah. Uh, when I saw that, my, my immediately went back to, I think it was a History Channel, uh, hour-long 
of films on prohibition. They may have taken those little pieces on prohibition from that film. And I thought to myself, my God, look at that. We went into prohibition, there was violence, murdering, it was horrendous. And it turned, and they ended up showing that the, actually, the consumption of liquor was higher at the end. And I remember, I think they even said that the mayor of New York had a little speakeasy, because he didn't agree with the federal law. But I'm not sure it was the mayor, but some high official in New York. Okay. And could we use that as a, first of all, as a model. <coughs> we, got, we got rid of prohibition, and life got back to normal in this country. And we may have got part of it by putting taxes on whiskey and so forth. And then I'm very conscious of the fact that we've made progress on smoking, that it is going down, not for criminal reasons, but for other uh, uh, persuasion. You know, be, be, be healthy. And we're st I think we're starting that in some ways about obesity, trying to get people to eat a little better, and better foods in the, in the, okay. in the market. But I, I like the idea of decriminalizing. I, I think it has to happen, and it worked out beautifully after pro uh, mm -hmm. uh, prohibition. Okay, we'll take one more question here, and then we'll take another round. So, so we don't get you this time. Uh, uh, we'll get the second one. My name is Mark Frazier. I have a, a two-part question. Uh, the first is about the um, trends in corruption, um, where there have been repressive um, approaches taken, um, how that has resulted in uh, measurable increases of, uh, of corruption uh, as tracked by Transparency International or others. Uh, the second question has to do uh, with the possibility of a increase in addictiveness. Um, the marijuana of 40 years ago apparently is quite tame by today's standards. And given that about one-fifth of um, the users of hard drugs are at risk of, or become addicts, do you see uh, signs that um, an arms race of sorts to increase the potency of addictive um, drugs is underway, and if that slope is something that would get it up to 50, 80 percent addictiveness. Okay. David, do you want to uh, respond? And I'll come to you, too. Sure. Um, in, in, in no particular order, I, I think that um, it's difficult to know what would happen in terms of uh, change in, in the level of violence. I, I understand from, from the point of view of economic analysis, it's you've, you've created an artificial shortage, you've driven up the price, you have uh, created opportunities for uh, the, the marketplace to be regulated by violence. But I also, in the experience that I've had, the only real determinant of whether there's gonna be violence in a particular place or not seems to be the existence of strong social, political, and criminal justice institutions. And if those are absent, even when you take away a stimulant like this, I think it, it is hard to come to the direct conclusion that, that peace, order, and good government are going to all of a sudden appear. Uh, so I, I think you should be modest in your expectations, is, is what I would say. Um, on the, uh, on the, the decriminalization issue, one uh, important distinction to make, I think, is between decriminalization and, and legalization. And I've, while I think you can find uh, a number of proponents of decriminalization and uh, not uh, pursuing people who are using, uh, I think legalization is a hurdle that many fewer, if you'll forgive the expression, are willing to hop over. And so th that the distinction between that and using and having this as a commodity that's bought and sold uh, on the open market through a legalization scheme is, is quite, quite different. And notwithstanding what was said in the film about will this or will this not be somehow commercialized, um, I think that if it is legalized broadly in the United States and you expect it not to be strongly commercialized, you're expecting the United States to behave in a way that it never has. Uh, and perhaps that will come to pass. But I know right now that uh, one of the uh, issues that uh, the board, uh, the International Narcotics Control Board considers is there is a, a general legal obligation not to advertise things that are controlled by the conventions. Yet we all know we can turn on various TV programs at night and hear all of these wonderful things 
these wonderful uh, psychotropic substances we can go and talk to our physician about prescribing for us. So I think if that's the case, you should not expect m marijuana were it to be legalized broadly not to be an advertised product and you should expect uh, not necessarily Philip Morris but uh, a similarly um, skilled corporation in getting uh, uh, products before consumers to to pursue that. On the question of, uh, of, the, um, of the potency of uh, various uh, marijuana and, and cannabis substances Broadly speaking, the THC content has gone up. Uh, I don't know if you should, should expect, uh, if you, as you put it, an, an arms race. But one of the, the issues that is, uh, that is troubling in the contrast between Washington and Colorado is Washington, uh, is, at least as I understand it, intends carefully to regulate the THC content of the product that is going to be sold there and to at least make it labeled. Uh, Colorado has no plans to do that at all. And so there is potentially a significant risk over time, particularly with the product which is consumed orally as opposed to smoke, smoking, that individuals might ingest much more than they're planning to with some consequences that might not be predictable. Anything you would like to add to this? Sure. Uh, I think, um, uh, calling something the ambassador said, that it was, uh, Imagining a situation where no legal restraints uh, or constraints would be uh, uh, established, I think it's really hard to imagine a situation where no legal constraints would be established. I think, of course, we are talking about scales of regulation that could go through uh, to uh, uh, criminalization, to other uh, uh, ways of regulation. And I think one of the, the I mean, one of the main characteristics uh, of democracy is exactly the ability that democracy have to learn with uh, its errors. And I think on drug policy, and that's why I think it's so important to, to, to remember how closed the debate was in that, is that we have been 50 years on a model that didn't present the results it, it, it uh, uh, promised, uh, but uh, we haven't uh, had the ability to learn with these errors to produce a new, uh, uh, a new uh, model. And I think what is happening now is actually uh, uh, we are having this possibility. And that when we think what is the model that we will want uh, of regulation, for example, of marijuana, uh, we have to learn with the alcohol model, with the tobacco model, with the uh, prescription drugs models, and there are a lot of different models. And I can say that today, uh, in many countries, it's much easier to get uh, uh, to buy marijuana than to buy a prescripted uh, uh, medicine. Uh, so I think if we can reach some kind of regulation that would uh, uh, control uh, the the access to this kind of substance, uh, I think we are probably uh, uh, having a better situation in terms of. Uh, getting people to know what is the substance that they, they are consuming, because this is the biggest problem today. It's not the level per se, but the fact that people are not allowed to choose or to know or to decide uh, what kind of, uh, what is the level that are, they are consuming. They don't know, they absolutely cannot uh, have, uh, uh, they don't know the kind of damage that the substance will, will provoke to them. So having this free debate about what is the substance, what, how we're going to control uh, the access to information of how it's going to affect uh, uh, the body. And, uh, and I think we'll probably, uh, there's a good chance that, we are, uh, that we're having a better uh, uh, health uh, uh, policy on this and health, that, that, that the people will be healthier after uh, this model. I don't know, I don't have an answer uh, on it, but I think we should look uh, at this uh, experience that we are having now and, and learn with it and use, the, use uh, democracy with, with one of the, its uh, better characteristics that is exactly the ability to learn with its errors and experiences. Right, good. Okay, we had a couple questions. There's a gentleman here, right here, and there was a woman right back there. Why don't I take that one, then Meredith, and then uh, here. Uh, my name is Gabo Demski. I am a fellow here in the Woodrow Wilson Center. I am an ex-mayor of Budapest for 20 years. I, I was dealing with drugs as well, as with many other issues. Uh, my question is, I agree with the main messages of the film, that uh, these uh, supply reduction program in the form of uh, 
anti-drug uh, war and in the form of criminalization of the uh, cons consumers. These both failed. Uh, but if it has failed, the question is, the logical question is, that how we can uh, reduce the demand in the society? That is the logical question. Uh, and in our practice in the 90s, we introduced in my city, in Budapest, two million inhabitants we have, a demand a reduction program. And it, it was, uh, it is not only about the legalization of drugs, not at all. It's a very complex social program with education, healthcare, social policy, with, lo with lot of, lot of means to, uh, uh, to have a complex policy against drugs which, which drugs which can which can help as in Switzerland it worked it works in many cities and countries in Europe so what is your opinion whether instead of uh, reducing the supply the uh, re uh, reducing of demand would help in this field hmm. Meredith there's a question there yeah, uh, my name is Amparo Vallevi and I work for the World Bank, but I'm also here in a personal capacity. And I want to make three points, but I want to make it very quickly. Please. The first <laughs> one is uh, that I don't think that the film or anybody else is suggesting that by regulating or legalizing, uh, all the problems will disappear. That's not the case. That it's just showing that there are alternative ways to the status quo. That's all. And that sub they, some of them have worked in other places. Secondly, I don't think also that characterizing one side of the debate as uh, repressive policy and the other one as a health policy is accurate. Because those that are under repressive policy, I think that they are repressive precisely because they also care about the health of the people. It's just that they believe that less people would consume it under the current status quo. But they also care it for, I mean, they're not bad people. They obviously don't like the violence like none of us does. Uh, the third point that I want to make is that the presumption that because prices would decrease under re a regulatory environment, which is, I think, very, very plausible, if not certain, uh, that that would increase demand is an empirical issue. It depends on the elasticity of the demand for, for, for the drugs. The amount there demanded. Are, I'm sorry? Not the demand, the amount <laughs> demanded. Yeah, the amount demanded. Right? So it depends on the elasticity of the demand. There are products that are very elastic. A very small variation in price conduces to a very large increase in quantity demanded. There are products that are very inelastic. No matter how much you change the price, the quantities you demand that don't, don't vary very much. Now, the fact that in the film, as it shows, in one place in the world, it costs 1,000. In another place in the world, it costs 170,000. Well, let's look at how much is the demand in this place versus this other place. I mean, we have some empirical data to make this, this assumptions. Thank you. Uh, there was one more question here, and then uh, Francisco Toomey wanted to make a question or comment. Uh, yeah. Hi, uh, <laughs> my name is uh, Daniel Pacheco. I'm from Colombia. I'm a journalist, so I only have questions. Uh, one for uh, Ambassador Johnson. Acknowledging that there is uh, an open debate uh, on drug policy, uh, do you think you can go further and uh, speak about how drug policy orthodoxy might have changed its mind in some level after uh, all this debating? And uh, for um, Mr. Uh, for Pedro, uh, I'd like to know, um, I understand you got into a bit of trouble in Brazil after some comments regarding mm -hmm. Uh, the uh, uh, decriminalization of, uh, dr of minor drug sales. Uh, I is this still uh, a taboo issue in, in the debate? And, and I ask because it, some people say it might have uh, a really outstanding effect on uh, countries in Latin America, for example, where micro-trafficking is a big issue. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to do something. We have three complex questions on the table, so I'd like to leave our, let our panelists respond before we put on more. And then I promised this gentleman here, uh, he had his hand up before, Francisco Tumi, uh, the, the foreign minister, if you'd like to make a comment and before we conclude. So why don't we go with these three questions now? Okay. Um, Mr. Mayor, your honor. Uh, 
The, the demand reduction question, I don't see this as an either or. This is, this is a both and issue. Uh, and I, I think, I mean, it has been over, over decades. Uh, I, would, I would quarrel with the statistics cited in the film on the amount the United States spends on demand reduction versus supply reduction. I think that they are uh, not dissimilar. I think the, the demand reduction is much harder to do accounting for, uh, whereas supply reduction uh, tends to be almost exclusively government expenditure, so you can sum it up pretty easily. Uh, the, the demand reduction, since it's educational, it takes place in the private sector, it is, a, is a big push uh, and has been for decades in the United States. The film argues that some of it was, was uh, not terribly well thought out. Perhaps that's true. I, 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 you know, advertisers change over time. Educational philosophy changes over time. Uh, and I think that, uh, but, but I think that there has been a strong push in that direction. Whether the balance is correct or not, you know, certainly open to debate. And I think at the municipal level, uh, getting that right probably means a great deal more than, you know, any, perhaps than anything most mayors do because it has, it goes to your, your public safety equation. Um, on the questions that uh, are the, um, the woman from the, the, the World Bank raised. Um, yeah, I, I take your point. Uh, I, I did not mean to, to suggest that uh, the film would say everything would go away, but I think a disinterested viewer of this film would think that they were pushing you toward the conclusion that a lot of these bad outcomes were brought about because of the supply reduction effort and that they would, if it was taken away, they would disappear. I, I, don't, that's not a, I don't think that's an uh, irrational conclusion to draw from, from what they were pressing forward. Um, on the inelasticity question, I, I, I don't, I would not say that this was a highly elastic, uh, inelastic demand issue, but I think it would not be rational to, to believe that if you radically change the price, you would not get some increase in amount demanded. And I, th I think that it's, it's likely to be quite significant if you drop the price significantly. As to the, the geographic distinctions you, you draw, as the amount demanded in, uh, in New York, whether where cocaine is really expensive versus um, uh, Bogota or some other place in, in Colombia, there's also a much different amount of, of purchasing power available in those two different places as well that I think has a, a bearing on the equation. But I, I, I think at, at the end of the day, quantifying this is very difficult, but I think not to suggest the direction would be there, I think it is, is hard, to, uh, hard to defend. No, so, so I want to, I mean, uh, address this question that uh, um, the idea that, well, if the, the, the supply, uh, uh, if the policies towards the supply side uh, went wrong or didn't uh, have the, the, the result, we should go to the demand side. I think there is a, 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 a it's, it's not that easy because, uh, first of all, what you have to discuss is it's not only about reducing consumption. It's not only about reducing demand or reducing supply. Uh, it is about uh, looking at the whole externalities of this policy and see what is the, 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 what are the goods and the problems that society have because of this policy. So uh, if in order to reduce, and, and I'm, I, I, I'm really not sure that uh, uh, the demand will increase with uh, regulation. I think we, we really need to to, and, and prohibition is a, is a good case to, to say that uh, uh, demand could not, uh, there's a possibility that demand will not increase. But even if it, if it uh, decreases or increases a little bit, let's look at the externalities. I mean, would, uh, the, the, would the amount of people in jail reduce? Would uh, the relationship between uh, police and the youth change? Would the, the, the uh, approaches to, to take care of people and uh, the health approaches would change because we're not talking about a, a criminal offense, uh, but about a, 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 a something that would have a, a different approach. So those questions should be put on the table at the same time that if we're looking to demand and supply. So if you have the exact uh, the same level of consum consumption, but we have we don't have the same externalities that we are seeing of the, the this policy, I think it would be a, a good uh, reason uh, to change the model. Um, 
and I, I, I would like to, to um, I think it's a very important uh, question to say that, well, what is a health approach? Because of course, uh, it is with a health uh, hat, I would say, that many countries throughout the world, uh, and Latin America is a, is a very good example of this, we have people that are close in what we could call torture centers uh, that uh, would you know, treat people uh, with electric shock and with uh, 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 absolutely non-health uh, uh, approaches, but they, they say they are uh, you know, uh, uh, treating people and some countries and a lot of the, the budget of uh, health ministries in, in Latin America, for example, would go to uh, this, this kind of center. So what is the health approach? I think it's something that we should uh, discuss also here. Uh, and at the end, the last question about uh, um, my, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, my exit of uh, the Brazilian government, what happened uh, is I gave an, uh, an interview stating the, the position that the government had in uh, Lula's administration. And this position wasn't uh, uh, the same position that uh, President Dilma had, and she was the president, so uh, her position prevailed, uh, which I think it's, it's right. <laughs> this, uh, but um, but the, the issue was if um, first offenders, uh, minor uh, 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 drug offenders that were first offenders and non-violent, uh, if they could have alternative penalties. This was the issue. And after, uh, uh, and it was a, and this issue was, is already ruled by the Supreme Court in Brazil. So, uh, and and after my my uh, after my interview or some 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 months after the Senate, this is the way the Brazilian uh, Constitution uh, make after a Supreme Court decision, the Senate has to endorse it so that it uh, uh, can go into into legislation. So the Senate endorsed the fact that Supreme Court has uh, stated that it's unconstitutional to uh, forbid alternative penalties to uh, drug offenders that are uh, uh, first offenders and, and nonviolent. So now in Brazil, the rule is that uh, these uh, minor uh, uh, drug offenders uh, can have uh, 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 alternative penalties. So even if the executive branch wouldn't support this change, this, the change has happened uh, anyway. Great. Okay. Gentlemen. Thank you. Um, my name is Roberto Bando, and I think that the film didn't touch on an issue that I believe is significant, and is the relationship between politics and the drug trafficking. In many developing countries, and you can see that throughout Latin America, but also in other continents, uh, law enforcement authorities, politicians in the legislature, and even in the executive branch, are not fighting war, the, the, the drug war. They are partners mm -hmm. in crime. And I think that's a relevant thing that needs to be addressed when you think about a drug policy. And I would like to hear your comments on that. Okay. Uh, Don Francisco. Thank you. Uh, I'm a Colombian American. I'm a member of the International Narcotics Control Board. I was nominated by the Colombian government. Ambassador Johnson, who's my colleague, was nominated by the American government, and we both were elected. I mean, there we serve as individuals and not as country representatives. Uh, in my work uh, on uh, illegal drugs for 25 years, I tended to be politically incorrect on both sides. And uh, <coughs> in talking, I mean, looking at uh, the push for a debate, frankly, I don't understand what will be debated. simply because on both sides, people are convinced of their own truths. And the data itself that you can use can be interpreted in many different ways. I'd like to point out to the relationship between drugs and violence. In Chicago, violence was peanuts compared to Latin America. Four years fighting Al Capone against Buck Moran, 1.1 death a week. The biggest one, St. Valentine's Day 29. Huge number of people killed, seven. The order of magnitude has nothing to do with it. When I, 
when the film points out that the trafficking that goes through Central Asia is larger than the one that goes through Central America and Colombia or Mexico, I ask, where is the violence? I mean, as you mentioned, Mr. Rwando, countries through the political system control, have control drugs. In Me Mexico had, has had drugs for over 105 and, and 10 years. And they became bad when there was violence. In Colombia, something similar has happened. You look at uh, Pablo Estobar death, I mean he died. Don Berna took over, homicides in Medellin came down. Don Berna was extradited, what happened to homicides in Medellin? Immediately went up. So it's from the, uh, as <coughs> a Colombian and also Latin American, I cannot accept the fact that we can confront the world and simply tell the world, you know, for us it's natural to kill each other when they are easy to obtain illegal drug, I illegal profits. Therefore, it's just your responsibility not to give us that opportunity. Mm. When we look at the conflict of, inter I mean, uh, about at American intervention, and I see many times in Colombia arguing that Americans impose policies, sure. America has power. Colombians themselves imposed their own prohibition in 1948, for example. But the point is that Colombians don't realize that what the United States is doing, which m might be mistaken and we can criticize the policies if you want, is to prohibit something in its own land. And what my countrymen, my the Colombians are doing, is that, well, telling the Americans, if you prohibit, we'll fill your market with contraband. So who's undermining whose sovereignty? I mean, in today's world, sovereignty is weakened and the Constitution is obsolete. But in terms of the debate, you can have both arguments of weakening sovereignty on both sides. So the question, will be what could we debate? And then I side with Ambassador Johnson in the sense that we might make a few small changes. We can try to see if there is a possibility to keep addicts, to provide addicts with some drugs to medicine and to the doctors, or to try to take them away and so on. But that will require some change at least in the interpretation of the conventions, that prohibit every use that is non medical. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Oh, no, okay. All right. Well, uh, do you want to make a uh, respond to the comment or make any part of final uh, comments of your own? Um, I, I'll, I'll respond. To, I'm not going to try to respond to Francisco. I, uh, he's, <laughs> he has the last word there. Um, I, to, to Mr. De Bando, this may not sound like a response, but uh, from my point of view, strong governing judicial social institutions um, give in the, to take a, a, an idea from the, the presentation made by President Clinton, that gives countries choices. That, that's when they have, the, if you will, the, the, a country's freedom to choose. And, and it's by building those kind of institutions that those choices are made. And the countries that have been able to deal with these issues the best are the ones that have the strongest governing institutions. You, you, you can see that worldwide. That, to me, is a much bigger indicator than any level of cons uh, corruption from TI or, or any other indicator. One, one other point I would make, though, though taking a, a um, not issue with Francisco, but, but taking a point he made and embroidering it a little bit because uh, we're here at the Wilson Center um, this is one of the primary institutions of worship of the rules-based system of international law. And I, it's important when we are talking about this particular issue to recall that the, there are obligations among states that have to do with it. And since uh, fortunately or not, there is no hierarchy in international obligations. This has no more nor less 
ranking than the uh, ICCPR or the NPT or the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. It's, it's a UN set of, set of UN conventions. So I think it's important as we talk about this as a stronger debate not to neglect the need to refer to the international obligations and if they need to be changed to deal with that as a changing process and not as an ignoring process, which I think has a risk of erosion for respect for a rules-based system which goes much beyond the subject we're talking about today. Thank you. I guess I would just ask you that question too. I mean, how much mm -hmm. we talk about breaking the taboo and discussing alternatives and looking for alternative approaches, but how much is that limited by these international conventions? You know, what, how much is that really where the uh, the policy is defined? Sure. No, I think there are a lot of points on, on this that are important to to underline. First, of, first one, I think. Uh, as exactly because we don't have any hierarchy between uh, international uh, law in this sense, uh, the, the, the statement made uh, at the last uh, uh, OAS uh, General Assembly in, in Guatemala, chaired by uh, Guatemala, uh, that we should uh, understand uh, the, the drug conventions within, uh, uh, I mean, within the, the, the complex complexity of other uh, international conventions on human rights, I think it's very important to, to, to know that each country can, of course, interpret it, uh, uh, the, the result of those different conventions that in a lot of cases are contradictory uh, uh, with their uh, sovereignty. But I think, uh, so, so I think that uh, it's possible to understand that uh, uh, um, the countries like the United States or the Uruguay that are uh, now uh, changing the model are not uh, uh, breaking the conventions. But I think it's important to talk about changing the conventions. I think this is exactly because we believe in international law. I think it's important and it's time to talk about changing uh, uh, the conventions. The last time uh, the convention, uh, a country tried to change the convention to take out the coca, uh, the coca leaf chewing of it, the response of um, uh, 18 countries was that we couldn't change uh, this, uh, the, f the prohibition of coca leaf chewing of the convention because it would affect the integrity of the convention. And I think this is really, uh, 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 I mean, the integrity of the convention should change if there is uh, uh, enough uh, uh, arguments or reasoning uh, uh, to it. And I think there now, we are in, in a moment where this idea that uh, thinking that the drug uh, problem is uh, simple is, is simple enough to have one sole international rule to, to, to all the countries has been challenged in the international uh, by, by the experience that we have. So I think we'll have a process uh, where the International Convention will be discussed in 2016 and I think that is important to uh, uh, discuss the possibility that country would have more flexibility re uh, exactly uh, 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 looking at their the strength of their institutions, uh, the choice that each the, uh, country want to make to choose different approach on, on drug policy. And I think this is, of course, should be part uh, of the debate, uh, how to reform, and that time has come to, to reform uh, conventions in this sense. I note that yesterday the control board uh, issued a statement saying that the Uruguayan move towards legalization, which has not been completed yet, would be potentially a violation of the convention. So it's clearly something still out there, right? Yeah. Statement speaks for itself. It speaks for itself. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. I'm sure we could go on and on, but we appreciate your patience and your listening. And thank you to our distinguished panelists for participating in this very complicated discussion. Thank you.